Now that I've shown you the arrows, we should be able to draw the intermediate. Once we've shown the arrows, we should be able to draw the intermediate. So let's use the arrows here to draw what the intermediate would be. We should be able to use the arrows to draw the intermediate here. Maybe this is a little bit tricky. It's a little bit different than we've seen before. Let's start with this hydrogen here. Now, who's this hydrogen going to be bonded to? That's right. And I'm going to show it coming in from below, since the oxygen is blocking above. Who should the number one be attached to? Number two. And the number two should be attached to we can show pointing above. Who will this aluminum be attached to? It's, um, it's happy now. Who is the aluminum attached to, though, based on the arrows? Well, it still has these three hydrogens. It still has these three hydrogens. But it no longer has this hydrogen. This bond has broken, so the aluminum no longer has that hydrogen. Now we can put in the charges. Well, who is at the initial tail here? The atom at the initial tail, the tail that's losing the electrons is the aluminum. It's the aluminum that's losing the electrons, so it goes from negative to neutral. So you were right that it's now happy. It's lost its charge. And who's at the final head? This oxygen. So this oxygen must have gained electrons, so we have to make sure to put a negative charge there. Previously, we were showing the lithium as a spectator ion that was ionically bonded to the aluminum. But it can't be ionically bonded to the aluminum anymore because the aluminum has lost its charge. Now we can show the lithium as ionically bonded to this oxygen. We simply show the spectator ion as countering whatever charge we have. This is a bit of a technicality. This is not the most important part. But the best place to put the lithium now is countering this oxygen. And then there's no other reaction. Well, at this point, we, we would stop, well, let's see. We've got this intermediate here. By the way, it's not necessarily necessary to draw this hydrogen, because this would be a hidden hydrogen. So you can either draw it or not, based on what you like. That's the end of our step one. Now, do you guys know what it means when we put numbers in front of the reagents? Remember that means that first we add the, the lithium aluminum hydride, then we wait for that reaction to finish, and then only later do we add the water. So once this reaction is finished, now we're going to add the water. So you write that this is the final product from the lithium aluminum hydride. This oxygen would like to protonate, but there was nobody around to take up a proton from. But once we add the water, now the oxygen can protonate. So now we should show what happens when we add the water. We can show that product. After the lithium aluminum hydride, we ended up with a negative oxygen. Now we're going to add water to get rid of that positive charge. And I've already put down the arrows that we're going to use for that. Here's the product that we're interested in. I'm not going to bother showing the hidden hydrogen anymore. Here's the product we're interested in. By the way, at this point, it's conventional not to worry about the lithium or the aluminum anymore. So at this point, we're not going to bother drawing what happens to the lithium or the aluminum now that we've added a whole new set of reagents. But we can just leave that totally hydroxide ion just like that. Without now there's nothing, any, and there's not really anything else for this to react with anymore. So we've gotten rid of the charge on our main product over here, and now there's no more interesting reactions to draw. So this is our final product. This is a very important reaction, and again, this is typical of a lot of lithium aluminum hydride reactions, so we should summarize the key points here. We've seen that epoxides have electrophilic carbons, so they can be attacked by nucleophiles. 
who are the nucleophiles that can attack them? Well, we've seen how that we can attack them with O minus or S minus or cyanide. Well, here's another nucleophile that can attack a hydrogen nucleophile. Again, lithium aluminum hydride is basically a source of hydrogen nucleophiles. Even though the negative charge is on the aluminum, we know that it's really the hydrogen that's the nucleophile because the aluminum has no lone pairs. We went over this idea here that a negative charge and no lone pair makes the adjacent atom into a nucleophile. We should just memorize then that lithium aluminum hydride is a source of nucleophilic hydrogen. So we need to memorize what this looks like. Now after the hydrogen attacks, we end up with this negative charge on the oxygen. But probably we don't want to end up with a negative charge. So then we have another step where we add something to protonate. So we have the second step where we add something to protonate. What type of functional group did we end up with here? Alcohol. An alcohol. What's the purpose of using lithium aluminum hydride instead of some other reagent to attack the epoxide? Well, if we had used any other nucleophile, we would have ended up with two adjacent functional groups. Remember that when we're using other nucleophiles, we always ended up with two adjacent functional groups. But now we're just attacking with the hydrogen. So now we don't really end up with a functional group on the left-hand carbon, because hydrogen doesn't count as a functional group. So this is a way simply to turn an epoxide into an alcohol without another adjacent functional group. This is another way to make alcohols. So you've learned other ways in the past. By the way, this might seem complicated. I've actually left out a step that I don't think is important enough to spend time on. There's actually another step in this mechanism that I don't think lends any insight. So I don't think we're, we're, we won't go over that. Right. But in your textbook, they would probably draw one extra step here involving this aluminum. But I don't think that's going to lend any insight to us. I don't think you'd be tested on that. So these are the steps of the mechanism that are important to know. Why did we have to add the water here as a second step? Why couldn't we add the water at the same time as the lithium aluminum hydride? In all the previous reactions, we always added the water together with the nucleophile. For example, I think that in a previous reaction, we did this just a couple minutes ago. We did a reaction like this. Notice that there's a big difference between using a comma and using numbered reagents. Are you clear what the difference between those is? If you just use a comma, you're saying that you're adding these two reagents together. But if you use numbered reagents, you're saying that you're adding them separately. First we add the lithium aluminum hydride, and then we add the water. The important thing is lithium aluminum hydride has to be kept away from water, because water destroys lithium aluminum hydride. Lithium aluminum hydride is quite reactive. If you added the water at the same time as the lithium aluminum hydride, the hydride would react with the water instead of attacking with the epoxide. If you add it at the same time as the water, the lithium aluminum hydride just attacks the water. Sulfur is not that reactive, so we don't need to worry about the sulfur attacking the water. But lithium aluminum hydride is highly reactive, so we have to add the water in a separate step. We're going to be seeing this a lot throughout the rest of the course. Whenever we use lithium aluminum hydride as a source of nucleophilic hydrogens, we have to add the protonating agent second. Previously, we're adding the protonating agent at the same time as the nucleophile, because we didn't need to worry about the nucleophile attacking that protonator. But with lithium, lithium aluminum hydride, they have to be added separately. So it's important to have that in your notes that we have two separate steps here. And this is a way to make an alcohol. What do we expect to have happen here? Just let's describe in words what would happen first here. Who's our nucleophilic atom? The oxygen and the hydroxide. Now, who's going to be the electrophile? Well, as usual, we could use these epoxide carbons as the electrophiles. But now we have a difficulty because these are no longer symmetric. These are no longer symmetric, so it matters which one we are going to attack. Do we expect the hydroxide to attack the top carbon or the bottom carbon? Well, take a guess. Turns out to be the bottom carbon. Why would the bottom carbon possibly be preferable? Why would the bottom carbon possibly be easier to attack? We can actually use some considerations that we've seen earlier Is in the course. Something related to like F, like SN2. Mm -hmm. Can you use that argument? That's right. So how would this be similar to SN2? Why would the bottom carbon be easier to attack? It's less substituted. Because it's less substituted, less steric hindrance. That's, so steric hindrance is actually a very simple concept. We want to attack the place where there's less things to get in the way. So 
So in this case, the hydroxide would attack the bottom carbon. All right, now to save time, I'm not gonna go through the whole rest of the mechanism here because we're about out of time, but it's important to see that in this case, the hydroxide would attack the less substituted carbon. In this case, this is like an SN2. So because there's steric hindrance over here. So in this case, we'd attack the less substituted. Unfortunately, we can't assume that we always attack the less substituted with epoxides. There's another consideration. There's two big considerations when you're trying to predict patterns of reactions in organic chemistry. The two big considerations are sterics and electronics, sterics and electronics. Well, here it was the sterics that were important. 